I want to first uh, go into why I started this clinic and how I became interested. Um, when Chris was talking about how metabolism and research has been around, ketogenic diet has been around for, for a long time, that's true. And my experience with, with it initially was when I was in medical school. I was in Eric Westman's clinic. Um, I saw the ketogenic diet actually help someone uh, who was 70-something years old, had schizophrenia, and symptoms really improved. But this lady came into an obesity clinic uh, with this mental health issue as well. And so when I saw the difference, and I, Chris published the case, um, so I had very early experience early on seeing this patient um, along with Eric, and that inspired me to go into psychiatry with an interest in metabolism. So primarily I see myself as a clinician, as a psychiatrist, as well as an obesity medicine physician because my, my passion, my interest has been in, well, how do we treat obesity or metabolic dysfunction or insulin resistance? And I found that the mentors I had at the time were obesity medicine doctors and they knew how to treat it. And it was not a common thing that, that people knew how to do. So I feel very fortunate that I was able to get that experience. Financial disclosures, I do advise uh, multiple companies in the Bay Area. It's hard not to when you live in Palo Alto. I like to start my talks first by just mentioning that words have a lot of power and how we talk about patients with schizophrenia or with bipolar disorder. I don't like to say schizophrenics. Um, I don't like to say diabetics just in the same way. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, remind everyone, although I think this audience doesn't need a reminder. So obesity, early on, my uh, exposure to that, I noticed that there was a lot of stigma against obesity. Uh, so likewise, mental health. So I think that makes sense as to why I ended up combining them and working in this, in this area. So metabolic psychiatry was a term that was developed to describe the treatment of metabolic dysfunction broadly, whatever that dysfunction is, and using that to improve psychiatric outcomes. So improvement of these metabolic abnormalities, whether peripheral or central, whether brain or periphery, uh, in order to treat psychiatric illness, as well as evaluate the metabolic root cause of the illness itself. So generally, uh, U.S. adults with severe mental illness do die a lot earlier, um, primarily because of cardiovascular disease. The prevalence of obesity itself in schizophrenia is about double that of the general population, so that's pretty high, and it's already pretty high in the general population, so it's something that we do need to care about. It's also reached epidemic proportions in those with bipolar illness, and metabolic syndrome is seen in 37% in those with bipolar illness, and abdominal obesity is in 75% of women. But medications do come with metabolic side effects, so Antipsychotics are medications that do work well for symptoms and control, but they do have peripheral side effects. And that includes on the pancreas, that includes in the liver, you have hepatic glucose production, you have more insulin secretion. And so it's not just acting in the brain to increase appetite and increase in carbohydrates, but it's also directly acting on uh, peripheral organs. And so that's another reason why we need to think about the metabolic side effects also that, that patients are on medication for. I put this slide here just to remind everyone that medications, although they have side effects, um, they also do help save some people's lives, and it does actually save the brain. So the more relapses that someone has uh, with this illness, the more brain damage that actually does happen. And we do see that on MRI data. There's an increase in lateral ventricle size, a decrease in gray matter and volume, as you can see, with eight relapses versus one. So how do we address that problem? So on one hand, medication is saving and preserving brain tissue. And then on the other hand, there is an exacerbation of metabolic side effects. So reason that uh, we started this program and advocated for this program at Stanford was to address this clinical need. And this is a picture of Hoover Tower, uh, this is the campus. If you haven't been, please come visit us. The clinic is housed in the Department of uh, Psychiatry, so it's a picture there on the left bottom. And all the conditions we treat, it's, it's not just serious mental illness, but also a lot of other mental illness conditions as well. Our pillars of focus include 
clinical work, research, as well as community involvement, uh, public education. So we're really looking to put this message out for more people to understand this connection, because we all know that there's connection here in this room, but a lot of people out there don't. Our clinical program focuses on working relationships with various departments, so we do uh, work with primary care, as well as endocrinology, bipolar clinic. We have subspecialty clinics at Stanford, so there's OCD clinic, bipolar clinic, sleep medicine, women's wellness, as well as eating disorder and addiction clinics. So we, we try to have good working relationships with all clinics so that, so that we're able to um, partner together. So improving metabolic dysfunction includes several methods. There's also a pilot study that we did looking at an eating disorder population of binge eating disorder and bulimia, and it was a medication as well. It was actually an obesity medication, fentramine to pyramid combination extended release, basically an example of improving metabolic dysfunction as well as mental health symptoms, eating disorder behavior, essentially. But I am going to focus on the nutrition and the ketogenic diet in our pilot study uh, very soon, but also wanted to mention that a colleague in our department did study in schizophrenia with movement, also just running, and that actually increased BDNF and improved cognition. I'm also going to briefly just mention the ketogenic diet and binge eating disorder as well. We did published a case series that uh, looked at three individuals that had improvements in depression scores, in binge eating severity, as well as um, the Yale Food Addiction Scale. In fact, even the obsessive thoughts of food had decreased with the ketogenic diet in these individuals. And we do see a lot of individuals with bipolar disorder have a comorbid diagnosis of, of binge eating also. This is another study we published on more like a review of just looking at the biological mechanisms as to why a diet that's devoid of ultra-processed food or a ketogenic diet could actually alleviate some of the eating disorder symptoms. And largely the main argument here is that we're preventing this cycle, we're preventing the rapid spike in glucose, the shift, and the change in insulin. Um, a lot of times with, when we think about drugs of addiction, there's a rapid change right, and concentration and blood concentration that's priming your mesolimbic dopamine pathway, reward pathway, so we're actually preventing that. And then we're preventing cravings, the physiological cravings that come with such a shift in the glucose, which ultimately also prevents the overconsumption of the ultra-processed foods as well. So if we look at the current state of evidence for ketogenic diets right now in these three illnesses, binge eating, bipolar, as well as schizophrenia, and we look at what we consider in science as most rigorous, we don't have RCTs, uh, we don't have systematic reviews, um, although that's something that's gonna change, and we're all very grateful for that. So we have expert opinion um, in all three illnesses. We have uh, case series and case reports, some observational studies in binge eating disorder, and now, if we think about the pilot study that I'm going to talk about is, is, is a non-randomized control trial. It's an open-label study. And this looks at the ketogenic diet in a population of those with bipolar illness or schizophrenia, looking at metabolic outcomes and psychiatric outcomes. It is a four-month uh, study, so it's about 16 weeks long. It takes place in an outpatient setting. Um, we were able to successfully make it a remote study uh, at some point, which was great and wonderful. So we have people from all over the country now as part of the study, which has been really exciting during COVID. We are looking at exploratory outcomes, weight, BMI is part of that, then the cardiometabolic parameters, as well as waist circumference. We're looking at absolute and visceral body fat. And one of the things as to why we looked at visceral is because the cytokine uh, release from excess visceral fat and how that might uh, play a part or a role in, in symptoms. Looked at hemoglobin A1C, HOMA IR, blood pressure, um, high sensitivity CRP, inflammation, and uh, advanced lipid testing as well. So the change in psychiatric symptoms, we were looking at uh, basically CGI, clinical global impression for schizophrenia as well as bipolar illness, and also looking at uh, global assessment of functioning, the Manchester Quality of Life scale, and the Brief Psychiatric Rating Scale. So we did include those uh, 18 to 75, actually. Um, we 
had uh, made a change from 65 to 75 this year because there was a patient that really, really wanted to, and I couldn't say no. I <laughs> they had to meet a DSM-5 criteria for uh, schizophrenia or bipolar illness, have it for at least a year, be clinically stable, no hospitalization over the past three months before entering the study. We want to make, basically make sure that they can um, adhere to the diet, and so since we're measuring that. And everyone had to have at least been on a medication, had some metabolic abnormality, because I was interested in looking at whether with medication we could reverse those effects. Of course, they had to be willing to consent to all study procedures, attend follow-up appointments, and motivated to follow the program. We excluded those who are pregnant or nursing, had any comorbidity of developmental delay, any renal insufficiency, hepatic insufficiency, or cardiovascular dysfunction like congestive heart failure, angina, arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy. We also excluded for active substance use. That includes cannabis. I did exclude for that, especially if they're smoking heavily or adjusting heavily. Alcohol over seven drinks per week. Uh, I did not take anyone. Of course, if they had a severe manic episode or psychotic state when entering the study, then that would prohibit compliance. So we excluded for that as well. So the timeline is basically when they started the diet, they were taught for about an hour and they were assigned a coach. And after that, they saw me weekly for the first month. Then after that, every two weeks. And in the last month, basically I told every, every participant that I'm gonna teach you so well that you don't need me anymore. So in the last month, they were seen once. And with most of the visits, we, we'd, so we did vitals and ketones every week. We also, did CICA measurements, which are the body composition analysis. We did that about four or five times during the course of the four months. And we did assessments, blood assessments, baseline, final, and in the middle, we did assessments that were psychiatric. So there were three time points for that, baseline, final, and midpoint. I did not advertise for the study. I only uh, put it on clinicaltrials.gov. I got 90 inquiries, actually more, but I just couldn't go through all the emails to count them up. Phone screen, about 55. Total that enrolled was 24. We did have one drop off, and the reason was that I didn't want to um, cause any problems in the marriage of this person because there was an issue with her being vegetarian and starting to have animal products and meat at home, and that caused an issue. So, so we mutually decided that it would make sense for her to drop out of the study. So maybe something to learn for future studies. <laughs> 12 have completed the study to date. We have 10 uh, right now that are currently enrolled, and they will finish uh, in early June. So the data that I'll present to you now is based on this preliminary cohort of 12 people. So small numbers, but you can take the data with a grain of salt. So just to define adherent versus semi-adherent, the way that we defined it is that out of all the ketone measurements that we took, if between 60 and 80% were between 0.5 and 5, nutritional ketosis, we would say that they were semi-adherent. If they were 80% or above, they were adherent. So the data separated into total, adherent, and semi-adherent. In this cohort, we had more uh, of those participants with bipolar illness. We had uh, about 82% Caucasian, 17% Asian. Number of suicide attempts on average was about one, so this is not a mild disease population. Comorbidities in general for pretty much almost everyone had more than two comorbidities. There were 2.6, I guess, overall of psychiatric hospitalizations. On average, you would see that for semi-adherent, there's a lot more than the adherent category, so that probably isn't surprising. So these are box plots looking at body weight and BMI being reduced over the course of just these 16 weeks. This is systolic and diastolic blood pressure being reduced in these 16 weeks. Same with waist circumference and visceral adipose tissue. This is fat mass um, and fat mass index. Skeletal muscle mass is very slightly decreased, but I would say this is maintained or slightly decreased, and that's normal when you're losing weight to have a little bit of that. High sensitivity CRP also decreased. Hemoglobin A1C as well decreased. Total cholesterol increase, and that's uh, to be expected with the ketogenic diet. Small dense LDL uh, was reduced and HDL increased. LDL increase here, triglycerides decreased. 
cholesterol HDL ratio as well um, improved. And then the CGI, which we looked at uh, CGI. So step BD was the largest federal funded treatment study, which most of you already know about, and it was a long-term outpatient study. We did look at CGI uh, because Stanford was one of the sites for that trial, and it was uh, quite an easy assessment to do. If you look at difference between one or two, it's quite a bit, so a point drop in CGI is significant, and two points drop is actually like a win. I would say that's a win. We got close to two points drop in this cohort. Quality of life improved, anxiety decreased, depression PHQ-9 also decreased, and PSQI is the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. That also improved. I just want to highlight here in the table that we did have a decrease in weight by 10% change. This is no without a drug. Most insurance companies cover obesity drugs at 5% in 12 weeks. 5% reduction in body weight gets your insurance company to pay for your, your drug. BMI reduction 10, uh, is another 10%, um, so a drop of about 3.8 points. Visceral adipose tissue is 31% reduction. Fat mass is 19.4% reduction. And then that translates to 19, uh, about 19 pounds. The uh, triglycerides went down um, by 39 points, and the small dense LDL went down by 37. PHQ-9, again, um, about 25% reduction. CGI, 33% reduction. MANSA, 23% improvement. Sleep improvement, uh, 27%. The main thing I wanted to just mention here is that if you look at the blue, it's higher in most of these categories because that's the group that was most adherent. In the red, they're semi-adherent, but they're still getting benefit on all these markers. I wanted to point out that adverse effects actually didn't last more than uh, three weeks. And the uh, medication changes here in this group, about 58% didn't have a change in meds, but there was an increase in 25, about 25% and decrease in meds, 17%. And this is tricky because there's a lot of different types of medications, um, and it's a small cohort. I did have a short little uh, testimonial. These are participants in the trial as well as uh, patients in the clinic. As a person who is the victim of severe trauma, sexual, emotional, and physical incest and other abuse, I had a very different, difficult time eating and living a healthy life. Eating was very traumatic for me as I was punished for eating quite severely. And I developed several eating disorders in my life and ended up in an eating disorder treatment center ultimately where I stayed for almost three years. And I was diagnosed with several eating disorders and oscillated between a very high weight um, in the 300s and to a very low weight where I was underweight. I was very stressed always about eating when I go to the grocery store about what to eat, what not to eat, how to eat it, and it contributed to anxiety and depression and dissociation. After several months, I have lost 100 pounds and I no longer stress about what to eat. It is so easy. Along with being bipolar, I started to develop visual snow syndrome was like a neurological visual disorder. And that's combined with just the regular mood swings of bipolar two just severely made my swings like bigger than usual. And that made me remember when I was around 16, 17, I did keto, I think for six months and I lost a bunch of weight. Um, you know, I, I felt better than I had, you know, in years and um, I, I struggle a lot when it comes to like a binge eating disorder. I've had that since I was like eight, nine years old, like longer than I've had bipolar four. And keto just completely removes that. And just the fact that I was able to notice how much different I felt energy wise and mood wise, and it was linked to the ketosis meant the world to me. Now that brings me to my next point about comparing it to medications personally for me. It's just like 
therapy is like five to ten percent for me medications are probably like five to ten percent for me and then keto is like 80 percent for me in my late 20s i was diagnosed with bipolar type 2 and adhd inattentive uh, and in recent years, I've been stable with a combination of 200 milligrams of lamotrigine, 100 milligrams of sertraline, and take the methylphenidate LA 60 milligrams to manage the ADHD. The ketogenic diet for me has been beneficial, obviously, from the weight loss that follows, but mainly from the increased energy that I feel, even after a good night's sleep of eight or nine hours, I would still feel tired in the middle of the day uh, and felt the need to nap. Whereas now I don't feel that need at all and can get through a day and still have energy at the end of the day to clean house or cook, whatever I might need to do. Well, I've been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. My, before I was on ketosis, I was having hallucinations probably once every two weeks or so. And it was always something like small that made me question reality or looked like a glitch or something. Um, my paranoia was much worse. I would uh, have paranoia a couple times a day, uh, focused around people moving against me or um, having a connection to the people that talked to me uh, in my, what I call my uh, channel in my brain, the frequency that I pick up, um, but that has decreased significantly since I started ketogenic diet. When I first started, I had a slight increase in hallucinations and then they wore away very quickly. Uh, I had high anxiety levels where my whole body would be shaking and I couldn't do anything or think about anything. I was just very anxious and anything could set it off. Since being on the ketogenic diet, I haven't noticed any significant anxiety levels or attacks, and I've been able to work through basically everything I've come across. When I'm in high ketones, my mind is in a mental state where I feel like I can accomplish things and I can focus on positive things rather than negative things. I just wanted to mention that the last patient, this, he's in the study, he's an engineer at Tesla, the previous individual who talked about the bipolar illness and um, the visual snow, he was on disability for many, many years and actually wrote a Reddit uh, post that he was thinking about assisted suicide, looking for options on how to figure out how to do that. And he enrolled in the trial and he's feeling a lot better. I actually spoke to him last week, even though he's completed the trial. He's no longer on disability, he has a personal trainer, he has a job, um, and he's a lot happier. And he's still on keto. So I think I'm gonna end here, although I had more, but <laughs> I clearly have to end. Okay. Thank you, Siobhan.